So in this video, we are going to get into talking about sound perception. How do we convert the sound waves that are coming to our ears into nerve signals that go into the brain? And then how do we process these nerve signals? So understanding a little bit of this biology will be important in really understanding why in music we tend to have certain combinations of notes, why we think that certain things sound harmonious and other things sound dissonant, and understanding what is the basis for choosing certain notes in our chords and in our scales. And so our starting point is going to be a little bit of biology. And so we'll start with my representation of what goes on behind your ear inside your head. So this is almost certainly not to scale, but basically the structure here is that inside your ear, you have just a tube called the auditory canal. So this is just a, this is just connected to the outside. So if you have sound waves coming along, then the, the ear helps channel those into the auditory canal. So we have sound waves traveling down the auditory canal. They reach the eardrum. And then as we've discussed the displacement versus time of the sound waves in the auditory canal is going to get translated to some displacement versus time of the eardrum as basically has exactly the same shape. And so the way it does that is just because you've got uh, when you have these displacement of air molecules near the eardrum, that creates a varying pressure on the outside of the eardrum. On the inside of the eardrum, the pressure is mostly constant. Uh, so this is because this particular channel here, it connects to your sinuses, to your, uh, to your nose and mouth. And so the pressure inside your ear generally stays at atmospheric pressure. And so the pressure differences that you get when a sound wave comes along are what cause these vibrations. Now, the eardrum is connected to a series of three bones that I've indicated in this color that I don't know the name of. And those are, those have fancy medical names that I won't mention, except for this one. This small, this is the, the smallest bone in your body. It's called the stapes or stirrup. Uh, the function of these bones is to transfer oscillations of the eardrum to oscillations of something else called the oval window, which is, which is a membrane um, on this organ, this fluid filled organ uh, called the cochlea. Okay. So, the sound waves oscillate the eardrum, which oscillate these bones, which oscillate the oval window on the cochlea. And then inside the cochlea, you now have sound waves traveling through uh, a fluid and they, they travel down to the end of the cochlea and come back. Um, and so inside the cochlea is where the conversion of these physical sound signals to um, to nerve signals to kind of electrical signals um, taking on the nerves going to your brain uh, so that happens inside and so to understand that we're going to look at a little bit more detail of, at what is inside this cochlea okay. now if you want to watch an animation of what i just saw i'll include a video below there's actually a couple of good ones out there on youtube um, but i'm going to go ahead and just talk about what would it look like if you unroll this cochlea. So it looks like a little bit like a snail. And so if you unroll this thing, then it turns out to be about three centimeters long. And it has a structure where there's, there's an upper chamber filled with fluid. The sound waves travel down that that's connected at the end to a lower chamber and and the sound waves can come back this way and in between there is some structure which includes something called the basilar membrane okay and so we don't need to know all the details of of all of this um, 
but the important thing is that these sound waves also cause the basilar membrane to vibrate. And the basilar membrane has a very interesting structure. It is thicker at the far end and thinner at the close end, and is also uh, floppier at the far end and stiffer at the close end. And so you can almost imagine this as a bunch of strips of material, or maybe even like a, a bunch of um, strings, since we've talked about strings, where the strings at the end are long and are and loose, low tension, and the ones at the at the close end are short and have maybe higher tension. And so, you know, from what we've talked about so far, you would probably immediately recognize that these ones naturally want to, this end naturally would want to vibrate at a lower frequency, and this end would naturally want to vibrate at a higher frequency. Okay, and that's exactly what happens. Um, and it turns out that the there's there's a very dramatic frequency sensitivity to this thing uh, so that specific frequencies will make very specific regions on this basilar membrane vibrate and and uh, that is it turns out what causes these nerves to be activated so just a little bit more detail if you want um, on on top of this uh, basilar membrane there is something with an awesome name it's called the spiral organ of corti and so that's just you know a bunch of cells they turn out to be uh, mostly these hair cells and the hair cells have what are called hair cilia on the end so pretty much the thing that we need to understand is when the sound waves come along and they make the certain regions of the basilar membrane vibrate uh, then these hair cilia also end up vibrating and through some cell biology that results in electrical signals um, being triggered and these then go down the nerve fibers and ultimately reach the brain. Okay, so pretty much all you have to understand is that there's there's something biological in this organ of corti that sits on the basilar membrane that ultimately converts um, oscillations of the membrane to electrical signals that go down the nerve fibers. Okay, so what I want to do is talk about what is the response to specific frequencies to say pure tones or combinations of pure tones. And so as I mentioned, you can basically divide up this basilar membrane into parts and each part is sensitive, is like most sensitive to a particular frequency. And those frequencies range from 20 hertz on one end to frequencies above 10,000 hertz, probably close to 20,000 hertz at the far end. So let's have a look at what happens. Let's just visualize what happens when, say, a pure tone of 900 hertz comes along and reaches your ear. And so we've said, okay, well, that's going to cause your eardrum to vibrate in a sinusoidal way with a frequency of 900 hertz. And then those various ossicles, these crazy little bones inside the ear, they also vibrate at that frequency. And that causes the oval window here to vibrate at that frequency. That causes sound waves to travel through this fluid again at that frequency. And there's this one particular region on the basilar membrane that likes to vibrate um, at 900 hertz, or that's that's most sensitive um, to these to these frequencies, and so that region is the one where the hair cells and these hair cilia are going to be most excited and end up trans end up sort of triggering their nerve to send an electrical signal to the brain. Okay, so this is probably a, a little bit of a simplification. You know, it's it's probably not just one nerve. There's probably some combination of nerves, um, but this is, I think, a pretty good way to understand it. Uh, what we need to understand is that is that there's a conversion from sound to nerve signals, and that this conversion, it depends in a very sensitive way on the frequency of sound that enters. 
So that's what it would look like for a 900 hertz pure tone. If you sent in a 3000 hertz pure tone, it'd be the same deal, except the basilar membrane over here would be the part that is most sensitive to that. And so that would vibrate um, more, and then nerves in this region would be the ones that would be firing and sending the signals to the brain. Okay, what about uh, a musical tone that is not a pure tone? Maybe we're playing a trumpet now, and so the tone has the pure tone as well as all these harmonics. And so according to our principle of superposition, you can think of those as just separate waves on top of each other. And so that's true of the sound waves out in the air, of the vibrations of the eardrum and these ossicles and the sound waves in the cochlea. So you just have a combination of several different pure tones. And as a result of that combination of several different pure tones, you're going to get a combination, you're going to get a variety of different regions on the basilar membrane excited. And so now you'll get uh, a combination of these various of these different nerve signals uh, that we would have got if we just had the pure tones individually. Okay. And so that's very interesting. Um, what we see is that the cochlea is this biological thing that is kind of taking our sound splitting it up into the various frequencies and then turning that into these nerve signals. Okay, and it's not just sensitive to the frequencies, it's also sensitive to the amplitudes that are present at each of those frequencies. So if you have a larger amplitude um, at 800 hertz, say for one instrument compared to another, what that translates to is that this nerve signal is going to be stronger. Uh, it's it's like the the nerve is going to be firing more rapidly, and so you can you get this your brain will get the information not only about what frequencies are there, but also about how much of each of those frequency um, is present, and that's pretty amazing because it ties into something that we've talked about before. We talked about how you could take a time graph and you can convert that information into a spectrum graph. And this is essentially exactly what your ear is doing. So what goes into your ear is a sound wave and makes your eardrum vibrate. And so if you look at the eardrum displacement versus time, then that is basically the time graph for the sound wave. So that is the input and then the output, which is the information sent to your brain, is the rate of firing of all these various nerves. There's about 30,000 of these nerves here along the, along the uh, basilar membrane. And so what we've seen is that when this signal hits your ear, then the various frequency components of that cause various parts, specific parts of the basilar membrane to be excited and various, and those parts will have nerves that send a signal to the brain. The strength of that signal is going to depend on the amplitude of this particular, present at that particular frequency. And so if I were to draw a graph in the end of like this nerve firing rate, which is just the strength of the signal going to your brain, um, as a function along the basilar membrane, just as a function of the position, then that graph right there, it is basically a spectrum graph, okay? And so the, the ear has this function that it takes in a time graph, takes in the information of a sound wave, and then it, what it sends to your brain is equivalent to the information that's present in a spectrum graph, okay? So this, this cochlea is like uh, a fleshy spectrum analyzer. So we're going to talk more next time um, about this and how this biological understanding actually allows us to understand uh, a lot better um, things about harmony and dissonance.